this. I think the Lord showed up, amen? He's good like that. He's good like that. So tonight as we uh, uh, open up a, a new series, um, I'm excited. I'm excited because the, the Lord, I, I feel like, and I, whether I'll do a good job at it or not, Elisa, I feel like the Lord has told me to provoke you. I'm supposed to provoke you, Kathy. To provoke you, Greg. <laughs> to provoke you. And so I heard two, well, really, I heard three words. The first, obviously, I already let the cat out of the bag, is to provoke the people. And then the other word that I heard, Josh, is incite them. Provoke and incite. And so, I mean, like, what that? What does that look like? Right? And so I'm like, wow, okay. And then this other word that I heard was a very interesting word because it's a word that is very, very dear to my heart. It's a weird, a word that, that I've, I mean, from the very early days of my calling, it's been something that has kind of been in the, in the, in the shadows. Uh, I think maybe the second or the third message that I've ever put together in my life was about this topic. I probably did a terrible job at it, but it's been a, it's, it, it's something that's been on my heart for a very, very long time. Unfortunately, the word is a buzzword in today's Christendom. And that word, we've heard it several times tonight already, is revival. And, you know, it was interesting because I, I, I um, I was sitting at my desk listening to a seven-minute um, teaching, and um, and the Lord said, "I want you to preach on this. This is the this is your next series. I want you to preach a, a short series on revival over the next four weeks." And and I'm like, "Lord," it's... and He said, "No, I I want you to preach on this." I want you to preach on revival over the next four weeks. And, and so I, I love the topic. I love the topic of revival. I, 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 it's always interested me. You know, and when, you, when you look at the many different revivals that we have over history, and, and I got to, you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm, as I'm praying, and, and different people are sharing during our prayer time, I'm thinking, Man, everybody's thinking I'm going to be, I've watched the news or something. Listen, I haven't, wa I haven't had time to watch the news, okay? Um, as many of you know, I'm in my master's program. Uh, I, I, I do work full-time, plus we have this church. And so I don't have time to watch a whole lot of television. If it gets bad enough, usually somebody tells me about it. And so um, I didn't know that there was revivals breaking out in the midst of these riots. And so I don't know what the Lord's doing. I, I, I think that in, in some of the circles that Pastor Lee and myself travel in, there's been uh, um, uh, an unction, if you will, that there is something coming. In the, in, you know, people, in, in the, that there's, there's, a, there's something coming, and, and we sense it, and, and I just, the Lord has got us here, and, and hopefully I will do a good job at provoking you and inciting you into revival. <laughs> and so, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. Think about it. Um, it's interesting because publicly... Almost every professing Christian would say revival would be a good thing. Not only for them personally, but for them, uh, for our society. I think most, 
would agree with that statement, at least on a public level. However, in an inner level, I'm not sure many of us are ready for it. Or, even more convicting, if you will, want it. What does it look like, Greg? What does revival in the 21st century look like? Is it going to be outside of our little theological boxes that we put God in? Probably. Hey, listen, I, I'm the world's worst in that. So, there, okay. So, you know, I'm not saying that in judgment. I'm saying, listen, the next revival is going to take us out of our comfort zones. It's going to break the rules. The rules, not God's rules, the rules that humanity has set up to try and keep a Holy Spirit wrangled. Well, I don't know if you know this yet. Hopefully you're going to find out. And if you haven't found out, you're going to find out that you can't wrangle the Holy Spirit. <laughs> he's going to come and he's going to do what he's going to do. And you're just going to have to accept it or not. The thing is, is that he don't care. I mean, he wants you to accept them, but he don't care. Think of it. It would be nice. Think about it. I was looking at the, uh, the internet today, and it's, it's neat to have the internet, right? Uh, for those of you that, that were around prior to the internet, it is nice to have the internet where you can, at the, at the, at, at the, uh, at the touch of a button, you can pull up those old articles, right? That, that you can see that, you know, where you see the headlines, God saves thousands. New York Times. Wow. Wouldn't you like to see that headline? Wouldn't you like to see God do such a movement that the secular news couldn't help but to put it in the newspapers, that it was, you know, as soon as Google opens up, it's there, as opposed to a scene of rioters or COVID-19. What would happen if revival broke out in such a way that secularism could not contain it? They'd have to. They'd have to report of literally tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people coming to the Lord. Not only the 2.3 billion professing Christians, but the other 5.8 billion people on this earth storming the gates of, of heaven, opening up the throne room to the very throne of God. They'd have to redo something. They could not not report it. And so, as we look at this, of course, tonight and in the next four weeks, the study that I'm going to be doing is definitely not an exhaustive study, okay? I, there's no way you could put revival in a four-part message, although I'm going to try to do my best in looking at li literally just four elements that would provoke you and incite you into at least praying and seeking and, and, and rushing the very throne room for revival. Uh, I get these two gentlemen mixed up all the time. I believe it was Charles Finney. Charles Finney had a gentleman in his church that when he prayed, it was as, this is Charles Finney's description of what this gentleman prayed like. And, and I don't know what this looks like, but I want it. Charles Finney said, when this particular gentleman, and I got to go back and get the guy's name. I talk, so I talk about it so much. When this particular gentleman prayed, it is, it is, he prayed as though he would do damage to heaven if it didn't get answered. Now, I don't know what that prayer looks like. But I want it. 
I, I want to be known as somebody that prays so tenaciously and so uh, earnestly and so frequently that God would have to answer my prayer or it would do damage to heaven. Well, that's the way we need to start praying for revival in our country. Because I'm not sure whether you know it, but it's a mess. It's a mess out there. The church in and of itself goes through cycles. There's, there's kind of five stages to the church. There's a, a growth stage, right? There's a growth stage where it gets to, and we see this in the book of Acts, where it gets to a spot where it's growing so big and it has to actually become, it's necessary to organize it into, so that it can mature because there's got to be some maturity because it's about, hear me, the American church has got this messed up. It's about making disciples, not converts. The American church is ate up with converts. We've got to make some disciples because what the disciples do is they go out and make more converts. We don't have to worry about the converts. Let's make some disciples. They're a byproduct. But once it becomes organized and it begins to mature, it becomes institutionalized. And when that happens, bureaucracy moves in, right? We're living this. And when bureaucracy moves in, guess what happens? Stagnation. And death. Listen, in, in, in Psalm, I... I Listen, I'm, I'm going to say this. I'm not judging churches. I, I don't think our church is like this. I, I think we, we have a pretty good hand, you know, a pretty good uh, opening for the Holy Spirit. But I, I, I sense that in sometimes, in some Sundays, if the Holy Spirit showed up, they'd ask him to leave. How many years had the Spirit of the Lord left the temple? before the temple actually got destroyed. But that stagnation and death, in that, is the seeds of revival. Because the church, with the Holy Spirit in it, can only last so long before the Holy Spirit, that the, 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 the inward groanings of the Spirit, praying God's will in your life with groans too deep for you to even understand, is welling up to the throne room, and God himself comes rushing in and breaks out revival. And that's where I feel we're at. You know, on, on a, on a, you know, when you look at this, I believe that we're coming, we're actually, I believe, I, I truly believe that we're actually coming out, we're in the coming out stages of stagnation and death. There's a fire that, that, that's kindling. It's kindling. There, are, you know, 10 years ago, Man, it does seem like it's crazy. It's been this long. 10 or 11 years ago, there was a prophecy over this area that there would be a light that would, would, would come up out of this area that would come up and that it would literally ignite the state, ignite the nation, ignite the world. Ten years ago, that, that was a prophecy, a, a vision that had happened. I believe it's time for the light to come up. I believe it's time for us to begin to ignite Florida, the nation, and the world. The interesting thing is, is that when we look at this and 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 
it's very difficult because as believers, we want to think that we want revival. As believers, we think that we um, are ready for revival. But I believe, friends, that as believers, we're neither in either one of those spots. Because there's some effort that's going to have to take place. And you say, well, we're working for this? Well, you know what? Let's just get over it. All right? Because there is some there is some things that are going to have to happen in order for us to, to, you know, because the provoking, the provoking is not only the provoking of us, it's the provoking of the Holy Spirit. Now, He's ready and He's willing, but will we provoke Him into action? Will we incite Him into action where He's like, oh yeah, it's time. It's time. Let's do this thing. And it break out. But it's not going to look like it's looked. It's not going to look like the past. I believe it's going to be a whole new realm. I don't even know what that looks like, but that's what I sense, that it's going to be different. Oh, sure, there's going to be some of the same elements. Of course, of course, you know, in, in the church world today, and I promise you, I am going to make this legal and get to this in Scripture, but in the church world today, We try to put God in so many boxes that we miss these moments of revival. When you look at some of the revival that have happened in the last in the in the twenty first century, in the twentieth century, or the twenty first century, there was many people that missed. Many people missed the revival in Toronto, the Toronto blessing. I mean, I got to be honest. In, in you know, in nineteen ninety four, I we had just immigrated over from Canada to the United States. Um, I think maybe it was either 93 or 94 that we give our lives to the Lord. And I'm, oh God, I don't know the date. Um, who cares? I'm saved. Um, but I'm sorry, I went off on a little tangent there. But, but I didn't know what was going on in Toronto in 94. And if I did, I probably wouldn't have gone anyways because it would have totally took me out of my little church box that I thought I was in. But think about it. You know, there was literally hundreds, if not tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people that missed it because what happened in Toronto was different than what they were used to on Sunday morning. What will happen in the next revival? Will you miss it? Will you miss it because it doesn't, that, that, what, you know, because somebody fell down and started laughing hysterically and that didn't happen at your church on Sunday morning? And you say, well, that's of the devil. I was talking to a guy this week as we were, uh, you know, the Lord has kind of put this guy in my face and, and uh, I, I needed to confront him on an issue. And uh, he literally said this. He said, you know, those people, that that um, pray for healing and and that healing comes that that's the work of the devil, uh, and I'm like, excuse me. So what you're saying is you're going to equate what happened in somebody's life as good to the works of the devil. Really. Listen, folks. The depth of our theology is God is good, Satan is bad. That's pretty much what you got to go with. So as we move forward into this, the church is going to have to do some things. And one of the things the church is going to have to do, I think we find it, you know, there's, there's literally, I don't know how many, it's arguable, you can find many different um, revivals in the, in, the, in the Bible. But I want to take you to one tonight. We're going to be in a couple different ones as we work through this service. And tonight in 2 Kings, I want to talk about the revival of Josiah. And so if you want to turn in your Bibles to 2 Kings in chapter uh, 22, it's interesting to see um, what happens here. Now, if you've done any reading in First and 2 Kings, you'll know that, that Israel and Judah go through many different kings 
And some kings are good, and some kings not so much. Now, Josiah follows um, Manasseh, and he's not so good. Josiah, we find out, we'll pick it up in verse, uh, in verse 1, it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jedediah. Jedediah, his daughter, the daughter of Adiah, of Balska, and, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and walked in, the, in all the ways of David, his father, and he did not turn aside to the right or to the left. Now, think about this. You're eight years old, so I think Brinley is eight years old. Can you imagine being eight years old and you just got the kingdom handed to you? I don't even know what that looks like. But it's interesting as you, and I, I, I kept the scriptures short because I knew we were going to be here. Um, when, you, when you begin to read here, you see that at, at 18, 18 years at, into his reign, he begins to seek the Lord. And, and Josiah, when you look at the history, Josiah was actually raised by the priests. He was raised by the priests, and he was starting, he was seeking after the Lord. And you see this here in, in his 18th year, he sends his, his people to go to the temple and say, you know what? We got to clean the temple up. We got to clean it out. And so in cleaning it out, they went in and they got all the money and they give all the money to the, to the carpenters and to the masons to go in and begin to fix the place up. And in the midst of cleaning it out, now think about this. And this is years have gone by. 18 years have gone by. And how many years prior to this that that temple had either set vacant or was a prostitution house? We'll get to that in a second. Yeah, the temple of God, prostitutes, yep. Male and female. But how many years that had sat there, and they go in there to clean it up, and they find the book of the law. They find the book of the law, and they begin to read it themselves, and somebody goes, the king needs to read, the, the king needs to see this. And so they take this, his secretary takes it to him and begins to read it, and it pricks. Josiah's heart. He begins to break down under the word of God, of, of what God had done in the people's lives, in his history. He, he, you know, if you know anything about Israeli people, they are a people of history. They're a people of remembrance. One of the very first things when I went to Israel to my Israeli guard, guide, she says, we are a people of remembrance. They remember everything. Unfortunately, they forgot the most important part up until this point was their God. And so Josiah cleans the temple up, and they're reading this word of God, and, and, and Josiah falls under conviction. He falls under conviction, and he tears his clothes, and he, he cries out, and he says, Go seek the prophetess for me of what the Lord would have for us as a people. I'm going to read it. They, they don't have it. Don't worry about it. And so it says, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants all the words of the book that the king of Judah had re has read, because they have forsaken me and have, have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger. We're not provoking him to anger, folks. We're provoking him to move in love and peace. And, and, and bringing his kingdom down here on this earth. It's here. We need it manifested. And so, because they have forsaken me, oh, excuse me, um, my wrath had, will be kindled against this place, and it will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which is Josiah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus you shall say, say to him, 
Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have read, because your heart was penitent, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard how I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that you should become a desolation and a curse, and you have torn your clothes and have wept before me, I also, I have also heard you declare the Lord, therefore, behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace. Josiah just changed his whole country's history for his lifetime. One person. Just changed the outcome of his entire nation for his lifetime. How? Why? Why? Because, number one, he sought after the Lord. Will you seek after him? Will you seek after him? Hey, listen, seeking out, listen, don't get me wrong. Pastor Lee and myself, we love that you guys show up on a Saturday night and worship with, with us, and, and, and we're part of a body of believers. But friends, if you're just seeking him Saturday night, you're missing the boat. If you're just seeking him on a Sunday morning, you're missing the boat. We need to be seeking Him all the time. He needs to be our first thing. And as Josiah was growing up, he was God was his first thing. And then he hears the word of the Lord, the law, basically the first five books of the Bible. He falls under conviction, and he begins to cry out to the Lord in prayer. Well, one of the things that I want to provoke you to do is that literally join forces, making a covenant with everyone in the room that we're going to pray for revival first in our own lives and secondly in our nation. That it would break out. That it would break out in our own lives. First and foremost, because here's the thing, revival breaks out when people seek obedience in obedience to the Lord. Now, we're going to address this a little bit, and I haven't got time to do a, a whole lot tonight. But, you know, there's a book uh, by Jerry Bridges called Pursuit of Holiness. Do you know that God is calling you into holiness? You already are holy. You have the holiness of Christ. But that's supposed to be exhibited and experienced in an everyday, in, in an everyday moment-by-moment situation. But there are some in our Christian uh, community that would say, you know, to pursue holiness, something that you already have uh, is legalism. Which is not true. To, to want to exhibit a holy life, to want to exhibit obedience to the Lord is not legalism. And we're going to get to, oh, I'll break down what legalism is next week. But look what it says here. He says that Josiah, the reason that his whole generation changed and there was, no, there was no wrath or destruction coming on his generation was because his heart was penitent and he humbled himself. Will you humble yourself before the Lord? Can I provoke you to humble yourself before the Lord? And if you won't do it for yourself, will you do it for this country? Will you do it for this nation? Will you do it for your kids? Because I don't know if you've heard about it out there. It's a mess. And it hasn't gotten any better in my lifetime. Matter of fact, it's gotten worse. We need God. We need God to break out. And it's got to get outside of the church. It's got to, you know, I, I, you know, you read these books when God shows up in, in this event or that event. And, and, and it's so interesting because when the Holy Spirit shows up in such a powerful way, you know, I, I read books like God Catchers by Tom Tinney where, where literally God shows up 
and the spirit is so strong that it's drawing people off the road. They're jumping the curb, parking their cars in the lot of the church, and literally trying to get in the doors of the church, yet they can't. So they fall down on their face in the foyer, and literally people are, are stacked on top of people as the Holy Spirit is drawing people. That's the kind of breakout revival that we need, that we want, that I'm provoking you, inciting you to pray and ask the Lord, oh, come, come, more, more, Lord, more. We experienced just a, just a tad of it tonight. We got, we got to have more, Marilyn. We have to have more. You know, at 26 years old, he, he, Josiah directed this, the, the house of the Lord. He finds the book of the law. He has a penitent in heart, and, and, and he begins to humble himself. He, he has this outward expression of tearing his clothes and weeping before the Lord, and then de declaring the Lord. He begins to declare the Lord. The Lord heard him. Listen, the Lord hears you when you're declaring him. Are you declaring him? Are you declaring him in prayer? Are you declaring him in your life? Not only, you know, here's the thing. It's a little bit of a soapbox issue, but, you know, hey, listen, declare it with this. Yes, declare it with your life too. Let your, let your, the words that come out of your mouth line up with what you're actually exhibiting. Let's fast forward to um, 2 Kings chapter 23. It says, Then the king sent to all his elders of Judah and Jerusalem, and he gathered to them. We're not going to have time to read all this. So I want you to go right down to, um, oh shoot, let's go down to verse 3. And the king stood by the pillars. He gathers all the people. He stands by the pillars, and he made a covenant before the Lord. He made a commitment to the Lord. He says, he says this, he says, uh, the commandments and his testimonies to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments. This is the Josiah speaking this. He says, to keep his commandments and all his testimonies and his statues with all of his heart, with all of his soul, to perform. You notice the three parts of our being right there? To, pro to all of his heart. When you're, the Bible's talking about the heart, it's talking about the spirit, the center of our being. It's talking about the soul, the mind, the will, and the emotions. To perform is to exhibit them with our flesh. The words of this covenant that was written in the book that all the people joined in the covenant. And so Josiah provokes the people and incites them to join them in covenant. And the, and the king commanded Hilkiah and his high priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that made to Baal and Asherah and for all the hosts of heaven. And so what he does, and, and, and so what he does and what we have to do is we got to start taking some stuff out of our lives. Are you willing? Are you willing to start removing some things? Are you willing to start removing some things that aren't productive in your life? Listen, at the end of the day, we waste a lot of time, don't we? Right? How much time we waste doing that stuff? Maybe we should be seeking the Lord. Maybe we should be lifting this country up to the Lord. Maybe we should be lifting our lives up first. Let's start with us. And then go to the, go to the state and go to the nation. He, kick, he, he begins to clean out the temple. Well, listen, guess where, guess where the Lord's temple is? <laughs> it's us. We need to clean some stuff out. Now, I'm going to go to meddling, Greg. I'm just going to tell you up front. There's some things you, that we all need to clean out of our lives, right? Like that besetting sin that, oh, nobody knows. Time out. 
You need to clean it up. You need to put it on the altar. You need to clean it up. You seek the Lord. One of the very first things that you see in every revival is people pursuing personal piety. Personal obedience to the Word of God. Find out what the Word says and do it. That's not legalism. That's obedience. That's what that is. That's obedience. Find out what the Word says and do it. You know, making commitments to the Lord. We see this time and time again where the, the commitments that are made to the Lord through o- obedience to what He's doing, not only in your life, but through your life, begins to be beneficial not only to you, but your center of influence. And as that center of influence ripples out, guess what? We start changing our society. Does our society need some changing? Friends, I don't know whether you want to know this or not, but yes, it does. It needs some changing. Personal prayer. Personal Bible study. It's it's interesting. I've said this, and I, I probably stole it from somebody, So, but the Spirit in the Word Both have to be 100%. I was going to say 50% word, 50% spirit. No, they both have to be 100%. You have to have 100% of the spirit, and you have to have 100% of the word. And as you have that, as you live out your life, that's going to be beneficial to your life and to provoke this thing called revival, not only in your lives, but in, in our center of influences in our world. It, listen, this revival that's coming, it's more than just an event at a church one night. This revival that's coming is more than an event that maybe lasts for, for five weeks. Now, how many love when you go down the road and you see a church that has a, a sign that says, Revival this week, so and so is in town? You know, and it, it's, it, I mean, I know what they're trying to do, okay. But, you know, revival is so much more than just evangelism. Now, evangelism is part of revival, of course. We see this. But think about this. Think about, there's a, you know, uh, think about, you ever heard of this guy named uh, Jeremiah uh, Lansfer, Lansfer? Jeremiah Lansfer, 1857, 1858? Anybody ever hear of that name? It's interesting, right? You never heard of that name. But just that guy was a businessman in New York. He made one decision. One decision. Hey, let's get a bunch of businessmen together and let's begin to pray. And you know what happened out of that? A million soul harvest in one year that went across this country from one side of the country to the other side of the country from the top to the bottom in one year. Just because some business guy said, I'm going to seek the Lord. Now, hey, you want to seek the Lord with me? You want to seek the Lord with me? And there were literally prayer meetings that begin to well up over our entire nation, and there was such a revival that a, that a million souls come to the Lord in one year. That's, I don't know about you, but that excites me. Do you think our churches could use an extra million people in them? you think our society could use an extra million people in them? You know, here's the thing, and I'm almost done. I know I'm gone long here, but think about this. If you've ever done any reading on the Welsh Revival, one of the things that they had a problem with, and I know we don't, we, our society is different, but I just want to give you a problem that, that, that they had. One of the problems, they had two problems, from my understanding, during the, during the revival. And I may be, I've read so many of them, I might be getting ones mixed up, but you'll have to forgive me later. So during the revival, there was such transformation in some of the guy's language that the donkeys wouldn't perform their task because they weren't getting cussed at. 
they had to retrain the donkeys on how to perform their tasks because the guys had had such a transformation that they weren't cussing at their at the donkeys anymore to do their tasks. What did that just do? It just changed an entire community like that. It was so bad that I mean, it was so bad that bars, nightclubs were closing because nobody was going to them. That's the kind of thing that what happens when a major revival breaks out. When I'm talking about a major revival, I, you know, I'm talking that something even, uh, although the Toronto Blessing was amazing, I'm talking about something 10 times more uh, inclusive than the Toronto Blessing. That the, 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 the revival in Lakeland, although there was am amazing things that happened in the, the Lakeland revival, I'm talking about 10 times bigger. I'm talking about worldwide revival. We're talking about great awakening revival. That's what's coming next, friends. That's what, we're, that's what I'm provoking you and inciting you to join forces and make a covenant with each other tonight that we begin to pray for. Are you willing? Are you? Are you willing to commit and make a covenant with the people in the room? Or are you going, man, the belly God is calling. I'm hungry. Because here's the thing. God's going to do something regardless of whether you participate or not. The question is, do you want to be a part of it? I don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss what he's going to do. I want to actually be a part of it. I want to be a part of inciting revival in our nation. Wouldn't it be cool is, you know, and we're not doing it for this, but it would be cool. I got to tell you, it would be cool if 50 years from now, revival that somebody looked back and it started at this little church of however many people uh, called Mortal Life in Port St. Lucie, Florida, Fort Pierce, Florida. I can get a hold of that. That, 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 that this night, this night, this, this little guy about this tall that, that, you know, never prophesied before in his life, the Lord hits him and he begins to prophesy. And it changes his life and the life of people around him. The last thing, every instance of revival, people begin to remember who they actually are. They remember that they're children of God. They remember they're children of God. Are you a child of God? Are you? Because if you, you need to remember, you really need to remember who you are, and you, remember, you need to remember who you are and whose you are. And live out of that and watch what God's going to do. So here's what I want you to know. Number one, I want you to know that revival is coming. And I'm provoking you tonight to join Pastor Lee, myself, Shanna, Jill, and anyone else to join Covenant and just begin to pray and pray and pray for revival to come. And that God would choose us for it to start in. Secondly, I want you to feel empowered. As we sing, God has given us the authority to pray for this kind of stuff. This is how it happens. Just a, a handful of people decide they've had enough. Have you had enough yet? Have you had enough yet? Are you tired enough to watch our world fall apart around us and the things that we love? Are you tired enough or not? You want some more? Are you going to drop the ball? 
Because the ball's in our hands right now. Are we going to drop it or are we going to go for it? I say we go for it. Well, here's what I want you to do. you got to pray. Because if we don't pray, nothing good happens on earth without prayer. So we're going to start tonight. So I'm not sure how we're going to do this, but let's just start by praying and seeing where the Lord leads us. And I'm going to take this microphone off, and we're just going to pray.